Welcome to Spirits Podcast, a boozy dive into mythology, legends, and folklore. Every week, we pour a drink and learn about a new story from around the world. I'm Amanda. And I'm Julia. And this is episode 153, Multimedia Mythmaking with Carmen Maria Machado. You've really been killing it with the guests lately. I'm very, very impressed. Thank you. I am also impressed with myself that I did not uh, fall all over myself when Carmen came to visit us uh, in the studio. I have loved her writing for a long time. And this is one of my favorite interviews I think we've ever done about uh, like modern myths about TV and film and Gordon Ramsay and also like sexual assault and surviving abuse. We Mm -hmm. definitely get into some heavier topics. So check out those content warnings in the description that Julia puts together for each episode, just so you can be informed and, you know, make a good choice for you. But I was absolutely floored and I love it. And I hope that you love it too. Do you know who else makes really good choices, Amanda? Is it our new patrons, Ray, Rhea, 50 Bad Songs, Christine, Janine, and Wild Geese? Yes, yes it is. As well as our supporting producer-level patrons, Philip, Alpha Dogs, Deborah, Molly, Megan, Skyla, Samantha, Sammy, Josie, Neil, Jessica, and Phil Fresh. They are absolutely wonderful, and they socialize all the time watching their favorite food TV with our legend-level patrons. Morgan, Emily, James, BM, Yep, Scotty, Audra, Chris, Mark, Cody, Mr. Folk, Sarah, and Jack Marie. Yeah, they're all lovely people. What, what they really what are. What cool folks. I would watch Chopped with them every day of the week. I wonder if uh, wild geese are more or less chaotic than one untitled goose. Mm, I, I think because wild and more, less planning. <laughs> yes, but Julia, you notice a herd or a flock of wild geese coming at you. You don't notice the one untitled goose. Just a cheeky little goose who loves drama. They could pull a whole, like, velociraptors in Jurassic Park thing, though, where they hunt as a pack, Mm, and one distracts you, and then the rest come in. Very true. I guess I would rather fight one big horse-sized goose. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Speaking of which, as I contemplate uh, just my mortality vis-a-vis geese, uh, remind us what we were drinking this episode. So you and I were sipping Aperol spritzers during the episode, but since we mentioned the infamous Gordon Ramsay during the interview, I wanted to recommend for the people at home to make one of his more famous cocktails, which is the Street Spritz. I love the Street Spritz. It's basically elderflower cordial, grapefruit bitters, and vermouth. So like boozy, but also floral and a little bit bitter. I like it. That's very up Julia's alley. I am doing my best to expand my palate. I prefer the, you know, like extremely whiskey forward, old fashioned type Mm. of drink. But I, I do like a springy drink, especially as we're kind of descending into winter here. Yeah. So if you're one of our patrons who receives the recipe cards, I'll have a version of this week's for you to try at home. It's gonna be really good. Delicious. And what do you recommend that we like read, watch, or listen to as we're sipping our spritz? Ooh, so I picked up uh, a book called Sisters of the Vast Black by Lena Rather, which uh, I saw a recommendation on Twitter by one of my favorite authors, Sarah Gailey. Uh, and basically, the book deals with uh, religion, faith, imperialism, and also humanity. And I'm here for it. It's basically Earth before we used it up and it got destroyed, sent out Ooh. religious flocks into space. And this follows a sister sisterhood of uh, religion as they're kind of drawn to people that cry out for help. Love that. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. No, it's really really so good, Julia. Thank you. I'm really excited for it. And it's one of those books, too. I think it's like 150 pages or something like that, where I can read it in one day and I feel really satisfied. So good. So Mm -hmm. good. Also very exciting, Julia, is our new merch. New Ooh, merch. We have a brand new piece of merch to share with all of you. We have a spirits beanie. It's getting chilly. You might have to cover up your tattoos and your winter coat might not have as many of your cute queer pins as your like fall jacket, but you can still telegraph to the world that you love all things creepy, cool, boozy, and ghostly with your spirits beanie. Yes, no, it's really, really cool. I'm I'm a big fan of the beanie in fall and winter, especially because now like I have long hair again, so I can like show it off with the beanie. Whereas uh, when I had short hair, I felt a little bit weirder wearing the beanie. I don't know. But I, I love a beanie now. At spiritspodcast.com slash merch, you can get the new beanie. You can get uh, the the last of our water spirit pins. There are just a few left, and uh, and we have those there. We also have now a couple of things from Multitude, and we're going to be adding more. So you can get our exclusive tour posters from Portland earlier this year and then from our summer and fall tour. They are beautiful. They have little like Easter eggs for each of the Multitude shows. Potterless has new merch. Horse has a shirt that says Sup Nerds, it's basketball. Join the party. Has character pins. 
Join the party has pins of Chad and Oatcake and Anora and Tracy, and it is extremely exciting. I'm so excited for those. I want an Oatcake pin real bad. So you can see the merch from all of our shows, including the New Spirits Beanie, at multitude.productions slash merch. Woo! Well, with that, I will leave you to enjoy Spirits Podcast Episode 153, Multimedia Mythmaking with Carmen Maria Machado. We are so stoked to be joined today by Carmen Maria Machado, who is going to fangirl a little bit, one of my favorite authors, <laughs> and someone who is extremely good on Twitter as well, which I think oh, oh. is two different kinds of writing, both of which you excel at. Oh, thank you. <laughs> That's a really huge compliment. Thank you very much. Uh, you're very welcome. And your books include Her Body and Other Parties and In the Dream House, which is your newest book. Um, and we are just going to talk to you about like anything sort of storytelling, mythology, fairy tale, folklore related. Mm-hmm. And we're so stoked to have you. Oh, thank you. I'm really excited to be here. Yeah. Um, where to begin? Where to begin? <laughs> Actually, I would love to know, what fairy tale stories were you obsessed with as a kid? Well, I there were a couple. So like anyone who's read my first book knows that I was really obsessed with like the Green Ribbon story. So like Alvin mm. Schwartz and scary stories to tell in the dark and his sort of whole oeuvre. And um, so those weren't so much like... Um, fairy tales but more like urban legends and there also was another series that i was reading up about alvin schwartz recently and i found reference to this other series from that era called like it was like scary stories to tell at sleepovers and i'm i had this like weird like tingly like flashback to like i think i've read one of those books and i really really they seemed really interesting to me so yeah so i was really into like horror and like retellings i had this book called the dark 30 that i had gotten at like a scholastic Mm. book fair and it was like stories for children it was like from the south um and it was just like these really like great creepy sort of southern stories about ghosts and people with the sight and i really liked that r.i.p the scholastic book fair uh, i know good. I th- but wait, stores aren't does it the not same. exist anymore? i mean for us as adults oh, oh, oh yes yeah. for us i mean yeah like i honestly <laughs> wish that like i could just like go like they were like hey carmen guess what it's the classic book fair this month you can drop just go everything. drop everything and go no i agree that was like my favorite part of the year and i remember those little like sheets that oh, you would be so given yeah. right and then i would always like circle them yes. but i'd circle like everything and my mother would be like no, you get Here's one book. ten dollars. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, and I was like, "But I want all of these." And she was like, "No." It's like um, you may buy two books. Go exactly. Ahead. <laughs> I mean, if I was lucky, I would get. I mean, I had a lot of books. I was a book fiend as a kid. But yeah, so um, so it was like all those like sort of horror books and things like that. And then I also really liked. We, I actually had like a version a Hans Christian Andersen anthology that someone gave me which like in retrospect was incredibly inappropriate because those stories are like real fucked up that's that, like real really like, dark uncut stuff very very dark yeah. so i remember reading being like oh the little mermaid and i read it and i was like oh no <laughs> oh no she <laughs> died at the end oh no because the original little mermaid is like horrifying like yeah. it's like her tongue gets cut out it's like she's being stabbed and she dies in the end like yep. it's just yeah. there's no it's such a fucked up story and i was like oh, okay well <laughs> Like, yeah, but I was just really draw. I, I was like, really interested in in that as well. I mean, it's it's one of those things where like I was a very like scaredy cat kid, and mm-hmm. I was like, but I but I would walk toward what scared me, and then I'd like run away really fast, but then I'd like go back to it. Like that's just sort of I feel like that's kind of my personality. That's such <laughs> like a in mood. general. I understand. That. It really is right. Yeah, yeah. Like so I so I wasn't like brave, but I was. I did want to scare myself, and even after like. I would read scary books and then I couldn't sleep or like I would get really upset. My mom would be like, no more. Like you can't read any more of those. Then um, I, but I would still do it. I would still come back to them, um, which I think just, yeah, it's just is, is me and a kind of in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I feel like I, that, that makes a lot of sense. If you maybe grew up to be an adult with anxiety where you're like, I want to know everything about the thing that terrifies me. Yeah. It's going to terrify me more, but then I'll know. I mean, I was an adult. I'm a hypochondriac. So I feel like that's like a very appropriate, like, yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm also like I'm a hypochondriac who like watches a lot of medical shows and like reads articles about. I feel like that goes hand in hand. Like that makes total sense. Totally, yeah. totally. And my wife is always like, "Are you sh- are you sure you want to watch that?" <laughs> like, <laughs> good for you. <laughs> She's like checks it, and I'm like, "Yeah, I think so. I think it'll be okay. I don't know." <laughs> How do you describe yourself and your writing now? I was reading a couple of um, articles, like interviews and stuff, in preparation for the interview, um, and I heard for the first time the word fabulist, which mm-hmm. I believe you used as like a writer of fables, which I never heard before and mm-hmm. is like a fabulous noun that I want to tattoo on myself. Uh-huh. Um, so do you see yourself writing like 
stories, urban legends, folklore, fables. Um, what kind of word appeals to you there? Yeah, I mean, I think fabulous is certainly a, an appropriate word to describe what I do. I think that there are like lots of ways to describe what I do. I feel like the kind of work that I'm doing, I'm just really interested in sort of taking what I want from the genres that I want. And one of those genres includes stories that come from kind of um, an oral tradition of a kind, whether it's fairy tales, folk tales, myths, urban legends, children's hand games, things like that. Um, those are really interesting to me. And yeah, and I think that's like, yeah. And so, so yeah, so I, I mean, I don't know if that necessarily like co- tracks directly with fabulism, you know, but I but I think that fabulous, I don't know, it just feels, that feels right to me and it feels, and it's, I mean, it's weird because I feel like there are some writers for whom like the sort of direct interaction with those sorts of stories are like their project, like as a as their career. And I don't think that's necessarily like encompassing all of the work that I do, but it certainly is something that um, I return to over and over and I'm very interested in. Um, and I teach and I, it's one of my favorite weeks is to teach the fairy tale and folktale class because then we get to like talk about adaptation and read like, I always assign like 50 varieties of Bluebeard, which is like one of my favorites. Yeah. And I, all these like modern retellings and sci-fi retellings and, you know, the bloody chamber, obviously by Angela Carter and like mm. just all these really good ways of, so it's like, here's one story and here's like a thousand ways to tell the same story. And I think that there's something really like beautiful about that. Um, and I feel like, you know, so much of writing is like, when you first when one first starts writing you're always like imitating the people that you read so like when i was really little i would write and i'm you can't people listening can't hear but i'm making quotation marks on my fingers i would write (laughs) poems um which were basically just me rewriting shel silverstein poems like Mm -hmm. i would just take because i I thought they were so funny and i wanted to write my own so i would like write like i don't know there was that one like cynthia sylvia stout like wouldn't take the garbage out do you remember that one like the garbage like reaches up to the sky and then like it's like awful right um and i mean what happens is awful the poem is amazing and so i like wrote my own version with like a different name you know where i I was like just imitating right and so i think that the cool thing about and i think those people don't get that about writing they they think that there's sort of this wholesale act of creation but like all writing is about what you've read and what you've consumed like as a reader as an artist as a consumer of art and then you're sort of churning that up inside of you and like there's something that comes out and it's like kind of the the result of all that. And that's why when I'm feeling stuck with my work, like reading is really helpful to me because it kind of just shakes all that stuff loose in my head. And I think when people don't read, it's harder to create, to, to write because you don't, you don't, you're not getting that kind of like stuff inside. You're not, it's not kind of being put inside of you. So in the same way, but I feel like the nice thing about the sort of folktale fairy tale thing is that that it's that idea, but like in this concrete way. So like, I mean, this is it's true of all fiction, but like the cool thing about folk tales is like you're just like, oh, that's like a retelling of like that's a story that has been told like all over the world in some variation, you know, and um, and there's all kinds of versions of it. And like you can look at different writers doing different things with it. And it's just that sort of idea of um, the consumption and, and creation of art, but made in, in this very like literal and I think even more acceptable and understandable way. So I've just always found it really fascinating um, because of that. I love urban legends for that reason. Mm-hmm. Um, and the scary stories to tell in the dark are, is also such like a foundational text for me. I would like check it out of the library again and again. Yeah. Um, probably not good for me in, in retrospect. <laughs> um, but I, I or love that. Or the best for you. I mean, <laughs> now I talk about scary stories I was going to say, I was like, it also like made you literally the person sitting across from me right now. So, yeah, you know. No, it's true. It's true. <laughs> and I, I don't know. I feel like there is something about um, kind of looking at the darkness and like, and like asking it to show you something. Um, um, that it just makes you feel a little bit more on top of kind of the like anxieties and surprises that life can bring you. Totally. And I think that urban legends, particularly urban legends, like really have a way of reflecting back our fears on us, not just us individually, but like as a society and like the way that urban legends shift and change reflects like what people are afraid of at any moment. Right. Um, because human beings have been looking into the dark and wondering what's out there since we, you know, existed. <laughs> right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Besides the Green Ribbon, which I am such a fan of. It's such a good one. What other urban legends kind of stick out in your memory as something that is particularly, I don't know, exciting or memorable or like says something about the folks who tell it? Oh, I mean, the one that I think of, and it's 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 horrible to like repeat it out loud because it's so stressful. But there was this one that I remember learning when I was a kid. And when you think about the historical context, it actually makes a ton of sense, which is the urban legend about going to like a movie theater and sitting in the seat and you get pricked and then you stand up and there's a sign and it says like, 
now you have AIDS. Do you mm. remember? Do you have? Did you ever hear this when no. you were like a kid? You heard? Okay, you're like, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I also heard it that. in gas stations. They would do that where you grab yeah. the thing at the gas station. It would be a there's a oh yes yeah whatever. yeah the hand there are a lot of, yeah there are a lot of variations on it. It's always like something that you would unthinkingly do in public, like sit down in a movie theater seat or grab a yeah the gas like pump. a payphone or something exactly yeah. yeah. So it was like it was like the sort of way of thinking about like fear of public spaces, fear of contamination, obviously fear of HIV AIDS, which like I mean when I was a kid in the '90s and like that was clearly a thing, and I think that legend's been around or some variation of it for like a while. Yeah, and so right, so it's like obviously it's awful and like the way that it you know sort of presents. I mean, obviously, it's, like, problematic in all the ways yeah. that are sort of obvious, but um, but it ch- I remember it really frightening me, and it made me think about – it's sort of, I feel like, almost like our generation's, like, razor blade in the apple. Mm. You know, it's, like, not a thing that actually has ever happened, but, you know – it's that it, it was just such a horrifying idea and this sort of violation of like you're gonna you're gonna you're feeling you know you feel safe when you're just like out in the movie theater or you're like doing whatever and then all of a sudden you know something has happened to you and you've been like contaminated in this way and in a way that's like permanent and unchangeable because we obviously like that's the fear of hiv right is that it's not yeah. curable and that you know i mean at the time like obviously it was like a, a death sentence that's not anymore but like so yeah so that one like really chilled me and like i remember someone that saying to me and i've never forgotten it and it's like weird because it's like obviously it's like so stupid it's so ridiculous you know but Mm -hmm. it just whenever i think about or then that's one that like a that like just comes sort of unbidden to me like i think about it sometimes and i'm like what a weird story that like someone told me when i was like eight and now i can't forget it when i barely even knew what that was it aids was you know and yeah and i mean it it is a way for I think kids and teens particularly to sort of process something that they don't mm-hmm. have the vocabulary to talk about mm-hmm, mm-hmm. in a real way. And yeah. this is instead like a, yeah. you know, through narrative or through kind totally. of the the imprint of stories they've been told for totally. their whole lives so far. Um, you can kind of get at something like that and try to, I don't know, like empower or forewarn like yourself and others. Yeah. Yeah. There's also a certain like paternal fear to it, I feel like. I, we're going mm. into Halloween season at this point, and I know I'm going to see a million stories about drugs hidden in candies and whatnot. Oh, my God. Yeah, Which I I'm actually like saw, like, favorite. an ecstasy, like, make sure your kids don't get ecstasy in their Halloween bag thing recently. And I was like, what? Who Ooh. just gives away their ecstasy? Exactly. <laughs> Who hands out ecstasy? Who, who gives away free ecstasy to I kids? Know. And what neighborhood do I go to? I know, I know right? <laughs> like ev- everyone I know who is done ecstasy is like like wants you to have a nice time and prepare you and like tell yeah. you what to do and stuff. Yeah. Not not my bag. But. I feel like I feel like um to since I to plug one of my favorite podcasts, which is You're Wrong About. I don't know if you've listened to it. Yeah, um, Sarah Marshall and Michael Hobbs, and they actually had a really good one about like the urban legends around like Halloween candy mm. and like contamination. I think la- last year. Um, and I remember them talking, they sort of talked about like, the actual real life things that had happened that sort of prompted a lot of those stories, which were like super specific and like not in any way just like a random person mm-hmm. putting, like just accidentally giving someone, like it's like there was like, I don't know, there was like one like actual, like a father was trying to kill his own son and put like something in a pixie stick. But like then that story somehow morphed into like, right. a man gave out like random poisoned strangers. pixie sticks. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so it's like a really like individually very sad story. Yeah. But it's, it's like not the thing that we are all afraid of. Yeah. And it also I feel like really gets at this thing about like it's like it's like what that what that child had to be afraid of were like his own father. Yeah. Not like strangers giving him poison. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And like so often that's the case where it's like that we we think that we're afraid of like a stranger doing a bad thing to us when in fact it's far more likely for somebody who loves us and knows us to do something to us, to do mm-hmm. something bad to us. Yeah. So. I mean that that kind of uh random violence horror seems mm-hmm. worse, but I think, again, it's it's like a little bit easier to – it almost like looks at the issue sideways a little bit to say like, well, it's just a random stranger for some random reason that you don't even know, mm-hmm. you know, that could be the reason for that act when, in fact, it's like a lot more tragic and yeah. seems more specific but is, in fact, so much more common right, um, to, right. to look closer to home in that. Right. I mean, it's the same – It's right. I mean, it's not to – pound the point home but like i mean that's the same thing about like sexual assault it's right yeah. it's like far more mm-hmm. like it's more common if you just assaulted by somebody that like you know you're dating you're on a date with than like a stranger coming out of the bushes right but we we are fr- we're more afraid of the latter because that's the one that sort of entered into this like mythological state you know of like and like here are some tips you can do to like prevent this like incredibly rare and i mean horrible but like super rare thing from happening as opposed to like the incredibly common fact that like you could be assaulted by like a boyfriend or it's just some guy you met or whatever, you know. So it's just, yeah. Yeah. And I think about the ways that gun violence, too, might be kind of uh, taken into this urban legend canon for kids mm. growing up now. 
Um, oh, that's interesting. Mm. Growing up, we had the the warnings of, uh, you know, school shootings and right. a sort of like very reductive kind of like psychological profile of a person who yep. would commit those acts. Yep. Um, but now, unfortunately, like you say, movie theater, and that's the first thing that pops into my mind. Yeah, so yeah. It, it feels like a, a thing that we are obviously going to be reckoning with. Hopefully one day will be an artifact of the past. But I feel like it is inevitable that somehow that's going to be kind of captured in the yeah. the lore that, you know, middle schoolers are telling each other over chicken right. nuggets <laughs> today. Right. right. Mm. I'm just remembering being in middle school when Columbine happened. And I'm remembering like people were so panicked that like they let school out. Like, it was, like, such a bad situation, and it was so sort of unprecedented. And now it's, like, I feel like I – I don't know. Like, I yeah, I, don't, I feel like we're kind of maybe a little off topic. But, like, yeah, it's just, like, this sense of, like, it felt so unthinkable at the time, and now it's just so, like, old hat, which is, like, not how I want to feel about anything that violent and horrible. Um, but I, the idea of, like, students – or, like, young people developing, like, narratives and myths and urban legends around – um shootings is actually deeply chilling and really interesting to me yeah um yeah because i mean myth as sort of self-protection is such a a thing that i think about not just in kind of urban legends and and folklore but also like how do i tell the story of my life and how does this like societal um uh, i don't know like instruction that i think of myself as the protagonist and the hero of my own story how does that impact my decision making because it doesn't just mm-hmm. impact the way i tell my story to others and the way that i like shape and revise the past mm-hmm. but it, it also like inevitably Im- impacts my future decision making and i don't have like a thesis about that but yeah, it's just like a yeah, thing yeah. that's in my brain all the time yeah 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 i do love the idea that we are like we're always the hero of our own story and to be the villain in someone else's story is something that's so typical for myth telling and myth building that I feel like I don't know there's there's I'm sure there's a lot to be said about that I don't have the thoughts in my brain right now for it but yeah well one one angle might be the sort of like hero villain dichotomy Hmm. obviously a lot that you can kind of play in in the middle there there's a lot to sort of like queer that dichotomy um and i feel like that seems to me a sort of thing that you often kind of play or write in um sort of like what you know what makes a hero what makes a villain like who is good who is bad who is able to do good and bad things um and to my mind the answer is never like a hero is good a villain is bad yeah i mean i think i'm i'm really interested i mean you know, with my first book, this was true, but also especially for this new book that I've written, like, I, I've become very obsessed with this sort of dreaded gray area, which, like, I feel like some people are very much like, what is a gray area? There's no such thing. And I'm like, oh, my goodness, there's such a space. And it's so wide and so misty. <laughs> um, I'm really interested in, in, so, like, an example that I, I give often is, like, I think about the the story Cat Person, which I which I know like everybody in the world read and I really I actually really love. And I think the reason I love it is because it gets at this really fundamental thing, which is sometimes you have sex with somebody because it's easier than saying no. And that often happens because you are a woman or a femme or female presenting person. And the person who you are gonna have you have sex with is is a man or mask or male or whatever. And And it's just easier. And that's the dynamic. And that isn't assault. It isn't rape. But it isn't exactly consensual, you know. And it it falls in this very weird place of like, and it's like, there's no, I don't think anyone goes to jail about that. But I do think that there's like a space to like honor and sort of recognize like the the complexity of that idea. And I'm really interested you know, thinking about, like, Me Too and thinking about, like, you know, obviously when you have sort of villains like, you know, you know Harvey Weinstein and, and Jeffrey Epstein and just these, like, sort of sinister or um, Matt Lauer or, you know, when, when, when you're saying things like, oh, he had, like, literally a, you know, sex island where he, like, trafficked gun girls or, like, he had a button on his desk that he could use to lock the door. Like, it's like, well, that's just, like, some straight like, out of, like, Bond. Villainy. It's such villainy. Like, it's almost comical i mean it's not comical it's terrible but it's like so on the nose and it's like if you it's like how i feel about trump it's like if you wrote it down you'd be like that's way too on the nose like take that out it's too comp it's too like obvious um but i'm far more interested in things like you know it was ambiguous in some way or another the person that abused me or fucked me over or like treated me like shit 
you know, wasn't this sort of villainous figures, you know, the sort of mustache twirling, you know, snidely whiplash character. Like there actually were, you know, um, it was somebody that I cared about or like it was a woman or it was, you know, not a person you would expect. Um, or the thing that was done to me was like nebulous. Like it wasn't as clear cut as something like assault because like yeah. there are other things. And I feel like we really, as a society, like we crave we crave these like neat edges and these like, did he rape you? Like where, what did he put and where and when? And let's put that timeline together. And they're like, well, if it doesn't happen that way, then it, everything is okay. And it's I feel like, like well, it's very influenced by uh, like crime procedurals. And it yeah, seems like yeah. you, you have to point to like evidence, timeline, provable in court, like right. knowable and irrefutable by like a jury of your peers. Right. And it also assumes that like, A, that the law is in any way fair or just, which like we obviously know it's not for all kinds of reasons. Or that 12 random people could like pass judgment on you. Totally. I mean, I mean, even before that, just like the yeah, act yeah. Of, the, of police and the act of sort of, but like even besides that, like even if that process was completely impartial and fair, like there's a giant spectrum of behavior that falls outside of illegality, right? That is shitty and bad and fucked up and like not okay for people. And like, you know, I'm really interested in that. That's super interesting to me. And it's more interesting than the sort of like villainous, obviously villainous stuff because the obviously villainous stuff, it doesn't come up very often, you know? And I think it's more important for us to like really begin to pull apart um, the, the the more nuanced spaces. I just think it's more, I mean, it's just more interesting to me as an artist. Um, and I think that's something that I try to write about in my first book. And it's also certainly something that I've covered in this, in this new one, this memoir that's coming out. You know, that's really interesting too, because I think that a lot of early mythology kind of uh, reflects that gray area. Like mm. we, we talk a lot about how Zeus is the, the ultimate fuck boy, the fuck father, if you will, <laughs> on the show. <laughs> And Zeus has done a lot of really terrible shit, but also he's the king of the gods and people worship him and give him, you know, sacrifices and all of that kind of stuff. And like, is not, he's not always portrayed in a terrible light. So it's really interesting because you look at that and it, there's no black and white with the gods because the gods are like human. The gods yeah. have human personalities and yeah. make mistakes and make faults and do fucked up things, but still like require a level of respect. And I think that's what I kind of love about early mythology in particular mm. is that there is no black and white. There is no, you know, Christian God and the devil. There's no good and evil necessarily. There's just like, okay and pretty bad. <laughs> you know, it's so funny because I feel like, I feel like, I mean, I was, I was sort of very religious when I was young and I was very, very Christian and I, I'm not anymore, but I, but I think a lot about, you know, the, to me, the best parts of the Bible for like the parts where like Jesus gets super fucking mad, you know, he like turns some tables over, he like curses a fig tree. Like he's just like, and I'm like, that is so much more interesting <laughs> to me than like, and I feel like in, in Sunday school, they always like really draw this hard line. They'd be like, oh, it's righteous anger. Like righteous anger is okay. I was like, but wouldn't it be great if Jesus just got fucking pissed because like he's a human, he was a human being and that's sort of part of being human or whatever. I don't know. I mean, I like, I'm really, I actually was always really interested in like, I mean, the Bible is such a weird book. There's like my favorite passage in the world, which I don't know if you, I don't, I, it's, I think it's second Kings. I can't remember the actual verse, um, but it's about a prophet um, who these youths tease him. They call him old bald head. Um, and they're saying, like, love they, a good say, old insult. <laughs> yeah, they're like, and they. I remember like the line from the Bible that I used to have was, "Go up, old bald head. Go up, old bald head." And then he gets really mad, and he summons a she bear, and she comes out of the woods and eats the youths. Hell yeah, and that's the whole fucking thing. That's great. And I always was like, that's metal as hell. That's like way. That's like so. I love that. That's some like pan bullshit, and I'm here. Yeah, for exactly. It. Right. It feels very like pagan. I think is why I like it so much. It's just mm -hmm. so ridiculous. This idea that like yeah, like most things exist in these in these spaces, and that it's just simply more interesting, you know, and or more in, human. In the Torah, like Moses dies within sight of the promised land. <laughs> like, and does oh. that make him not a servant of God? Like, you know, yeah. there there is just such a palpable sense of like, consequences that um, I feel like is. I don't know, so shocking, like, they went there. Like, that's how yeah. I feel all the time, yeah. reading, like, the Torah and, and kind of other stories. Like, uh, it's, it's just, yeah. it's wild. Yeah. 
Amanda, this week, our episode is brought to you by Calm. And gosh, stress is a worldwide epidemic, isn't it? (laughs) It's real bad. Like we're all like even us who get to work our dream jobs, we're all working longer hours. The news cycle is exhausting. We're just like stress is a part of our lives and I want it to go away. That would be nice. Thankfully, we have Calm. So Calm is the number one app to help you reduce your anxiety and stress and help you sleep better. So more than 40 million people around the world have downloaded Calm. It helps with guided meditations to help with your anxiety and your stress. I really like those. I like to do them like right when I get up in the morning because it starts my day off right. Like I take my shower. I listen to a Calm thing. I take deep breaths. It's just easier that way. Uh, They also have the sleep stories, which I know you love. You're a big fan of the Southern France Lavender Field to Stephen Fry. It's a big one. That one's very good. And any train, Julie, just any train. Just all the trains. There's also a new one about like moonlit jungles in Africa that I'm just, it's it's so pretty. I love it so much. It's beautiful. They also have just like soothing music and stuff. So anything that's going to like help you reduce your stress and anxiety Calm is there to help you out. So right now, Spirits listeners can get 25% off a Calm premium subscription at calm.com slash spirits. Again, that's C-A-L-M dot com slash spirits. Get unlimited access to all of Calm's content today at calm.com slash spirits. Speaking of like meditative and stress relieving things, Julia, sometimes I go to Skillshare for like new skills I want to learn, but sometimes I go there just to watch the videos because the videos that they make are very high production quality, which I love. And also the ones about fine art and different kinds of crafts and hobbies that I might not necessarily have the skills to do, but I do want to know about them. I love watching it. So this week I was actually checking out a Skillshare class called Ink Drawing Techniques, Brush, Nib, and Pen Style by Yuko Shimizu. And it is so stunning to watch the just like paintings unfurl from her pen. Like I know that sounds silly because it's just drawing. But as someone like me who doesn't have a ton of experience or skill in that arena, it's really wonderful not just to learn, but also to uh, like watch and observe and be entertained by the kinds of classes you can see on Skillshare. Yeah, I mean, that's why people love Bob Ross and stuff like that or why calligraphy videos are so popular. And it's nice that Skillshare offers that as well as being able to teach you how to do the things and not just watching the person do the things. Exactly. And today you can get two free months of Skillshare Premium, which gets you access to all of the 25,000 plus classes that they have to offer at Skillshare.com slash Spirits2. That's Spirits and then the number two. Yep. Again, go to Skillshare.com slash Spirits2 to start your two free months now. Skillshare.com slash Spirits2. Julia, I recently um, realized that I think I'm going to become like a museum gift shop old lady. You know what I mean? Like one of those ladies who like only wears jewelry from museum gift shops and has just like statement glasses. Just jotting down for your birthday in February. Real quick. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to like really prepare for that. And what I've done over the last couple of years is like each year with when my uh, eyeglass insurance lets me pay for a new pair of frames, I just grab one from Warby Parker and it's really easy to keep my prescription updated. They let you like take take a photograph of your prescription, which is wild and so much easier than having someone call someone else and having to follow up and fax and like blah, blah, blah. But moreover, their frames are so affordable. They're absolutely beautiful. And you can go ahead and try those on in your house. You don't have to like go find one of their retail stores or go in there and be sweaty and like try to wear makeup. But then like, what if you don't have makeup on? And what do you look like in your house? It's so hard to tell. Yeah, uh, Jake actually did the free try on program and he ended up taking home two pairs of glasses one for his distance and one for his like desk reading and they both look adorable on him oh that's great it's just it's super easy you get to pick them out online they come right to your house and you have five days to try on the five pairs of glasses that they send you there's also no obligation to buy it ships totally for free it includes a prepaid return shipping label using the same box which i like to cut down on that waste and today you can try your free home try on kit at warbyparker.com slash spirits. Yeah, you can order your free home try-on kit today by going to warbyparker.com slash spirits. Glasses start at just 95 bucks, which includes prescription lenses. They also have anti-glare and anti-scratch coatings, and you can get those blue light filtering lenses, which Julia loves. I love those. Those are my favorite. <laughs> And even better, if you have an iPhone uh, 10 or above, you can actually do like a virtual try on where Warby Parker like uses the camera and puts those glasses on your face, which is super cool. So that's warbyparker.com slash spirits to get your free home try on kit today. And now let's get back to the show. 
Well, I want to kind of broaden the idea of like source material. And we talked about urban legends, mm-hmm. but also like Carmen, one of my favorite stories from you is based on Law and Order SVU. <laughs> um, yeah. And I know that whether it's video games, TV, like it seems like a lot of things are in scope um, for you and for both of us as well. Like we talk all the time about how some of our favorite modern myths are podcasts, are video games, like are kind of places that we don't think of as like capital L literature. Mm-hmm. Um, so can you talk a little bit about like your experience you know, reading those, playing those, looking at them for inspiration. Um, what are your kind of favorite examples? Yeah, I mean, I think Law and Order SVU is interesting in particular because I think it's actually a really good example of like a modern, I don't know if I'd call it a modern fairy tale, but a fairy tale system of a kind. Um, because Especially because Law and Order and Law and Order SVU and the Law and Order franchise often hinge on this idea of quote unquote ripped from the headlines or like a thing is sort of taken out of context and then kind of mashed together with a bunch and then you watch this episode that like sort of re- vaguely resembles reality but not quite but like so much so that like i remember during the election there was an i don't know if you remember this there was like an episode that was going to air that was about apparently about like a trump fi- trump like figure and nbc decided not to air it for reasons i don't remember i'm sure that had Probably. nothing to do at all with i'm the- sure it had nothing to do with yeah effects, so, yeah, so yeah, cough cowardice <laughs> cough but like yeah like so they didn't air it um but it's so funny because it's like, well, it's fiction, so like, who cares? But it's like, obviously, it like was close enough that it hit some kind of note. So I, so I sort of feel like, um, and it's been going on for so long, and it just has such a like a place in our culture and this sort of u- u- ub- ubiquitousness that I think is is sort of similar to the fairy tale as we more traditionally understand it. And so, yeah, it just feels like that's that's what it is. And so it was a real pleasure to get to like play with that. And I think, yeah, I mean, whenever I. I do anything, I read anything, I watch anything, I play any video games. Like, I'm always thinking about what is it in here that gives me, like, a kind of narrative pleasure where I can sort of derive something from this this idea. So, like, a really example I usually give is I really love this thing that happens on a lot of video games where you have to, like, you know, clear out, you know, insert X here. It's like a raw... a thieves den or like a war you know it's it's like it's like a like a collective of enemies which you have to like approach in a certain way and like clear out and like you can get loot right and i always think it's really funny when i play games like that where when you approach it you know you're always like hearing their chatter like they're always chattering at each other and they're usually just these like kind of work a day like you know like they're not like top brass like they're all yeah, just yeah. sort of like you know they just live in their lives they're just like living their shirts. lives it's like yeah. you just they got a job as like a thief and a whatever you know that that's just like they're or like a or like a they're like mercenaries or like mercenary a, yeah exactly pub. exactly and like i always am so tickled by their dialogue which also if you stand there long enough will be to repeat itself and it's like waiting for Godot. It's like, and you are like by <laughs> virtue of your presence, just like hovering off on the edge, like listening to them talk, even though like it's it's mostly nonsense and like eventually or repeat itself. And like, I, I, I don't know. And also like some of the games, like if you if you make a noise or you move too quickly, they'll be like, what's that? And they'll be like, never mind. You're just hearing <laughs> things, you know? So there's just something very like funny about that to me. And like when the more I play games and I, it's like every third game I play, it comes up and I'm like, I need to do something with this. This is so interesting to me. I don't know what it is yet, like why it's so interesting, why it why it speaks to me in this way, but it's just like kind of beautiful. Um that is very like waiting for Gateau though, because like yeah. I can imagine a fucking weird like 90 minute play where it's like the thieves in the pub or like all of the the like NPCs right. in the tavern yep. before a DD campaign starts. And <laughs> then what like what happens? Like okay, maybe the dialogue repeats twice, but then if like inaction is also action in that right. way. And like if yeah. no one comes to interrupt that cycle, like what then happens? Do yeah. they organize? Like yeah. do they fight each other? Like what happens? <laughs> I mean, I'd watch that play. I would too. I'd write that play. I don't <laughs> listen. If you write, just put me in the acknowledgments. Like it's all good. <laughs> yeah, I'd, yeah, yeah. I don't um, know. There's just something about that, and I just feel like that's like. And so I think to say like, and I mean, it's funny because people are always were surprised when I tell them I play video games, and I, I'm like, well, I mean, maybe you're surprised because I seem very busy, and I am in fact busy, and I do go through like lulls where I just or where I haven't played games in a while because I've just been. Oh, my first instinct was like, "Fuck you!" Not all gamers are like teenage white men. Like, oh what? no, well that too, but I think people, yeah, so I think it's a combination of like I don't fit the profile you would expect, and also they're like, "You are hella busy. How do you have time to play games?" It's Fair. like, well, I there are times when I don't play them for months because I'm like really busy, but, um, but yeah, and the idea that I could enjoy like a game. You know, not even like a quirky indie narrative indie game, which I, is also a genre that I love, but also like I want to go shoot some stuff or like cut some stuff up with my, yeah. you know, sword or whatever. Um, I want to kill some monsters. And like, yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> it's like, but there is something about the form of the video game 
and the way the way that like you know games depending on their goals fall into different sort of structural things and the way that games kind of adapt around like i'm really also interested so there are like two games that i've played and i'm sure there are more that exist but these are the two that i there's um the last of us which is like a yeah mm. this zombie game and then um witcher three yes um and which i loved and was sort of one of the earlier games that i played in this like new patch of my life um and both of those games have a male a very mask like male protagonist who is like either journeying with or interacting with like a young woman right mm-hmm. like there's a, like a you know a girl that they're sort of taking care of or they're sort of mentoring in a way and in both of those games there is a section of the game where it reverts the pov to the girl mm. so in the last of us like at some point i forget what happens to the guy but like he's unconscious or he's sick, and she has to like go get some stuff for him and it's and you're playing her and then in the other game it's like these periodic sort of like chapters where like instead of playing um gerald you're playing like this i can't remember her name but this girl um and what's so interesting is like when you've been playing a certain character for many hours and you have like weapons and you have all this stuff and you have a certain amount of strength and like skills and whatever and then suddenly they just like throw you into this like female pov that you haven't been experiencing the entire time you have none of the shit that you're supposed to have new body you have a totally new body and it's like really weird and both times the first time it happened i was like that's interesting i was like what is that huh like is it meant to be that like i now feel like weak and helpless like is that Mm. because that's how i feel because like i don't have any of my weapons i don't have anything that i've gotten over this you know um and then it's like so is that intentional and then like what does that mean and the second time it happened i was like you've got to be fucking kidding me (laughs) like (laughs) like why is it and it's so specific it's like these like male like it's just it's such a weird i don't even call it a trope but like a weird thing mechanic and it like mechanic yes that's the word that's the word it's like a weird mechanic and it's like what does it mean and like i keep thinking about it and as i'm playing i'm like there's something happening here that's like outside of my or that like i don't know if they intended to do it or not but i have like so many feelings about it and i mean this is true of like everything i consume like what i mean when i um when we were we were getting we were about to have our wedding i was like putting together centerpieces and I would like be in my pajamas like hot gluing flowers mm. to things and my wife would like leave for work and be like or my then my then fiance and I'd be like watching kitchen nightmares <laughs> and I'd be like bye and then she'd come back like eight hours later and I'd still be doing the same thing in the same position still watching kitchen nightmares Rabbit and after mood. a couple of days I was like I have a theory about Gordon Ramsay <laughs> like I just was like because I just seen so many of them and I had so many Please thoughts lay it on me. well I mean for for me I mean well if you want to hear I want to hear your Gordon Ramsay theme. Oh, there's very few things I love more than food TV and like critis- and criticism thereof. Oh, okay, okay. Well, I actually, first of all, I really like Gordon Ramsay. Like, I actually yeah. have a deep abiding respect for competence. Yes. Like, that is a thing that gives me, me a lot of pleasure. And so I like really respect, like, I'm like, he's an asshole, but... That's how I feel about Top Chef. I'm like, I know yeah. that there is so much invented drama here and the chefs are like increasingly like professional TV chefs and that's kind of like a weird thing that's happening, but also they are like relentlessly competent in what right. they're doing and it's so relaxing and like totally. Padma is always perfectly dressed and it's just like, it's <laughs> like just her so much. like, well, it's kind of like, me in this. right. It's like, it's like, it's like, it's like, they're just like a really good top. Like you're yeah. like, yeah, <laughs> like, you know what you're doing. I, I, rel- I relinquish everything to you. Like, you know, it's a, you know, yeah. you're in charge. Like it's sort of beautiful in that way. Right. Um, but the thing about Gordon Ramsay in particular, that was really interesting about Kitchen Nightmares was like that entire show was about negotiation of masculinity. So like the, the episodes almost always, I mean, there were women occasionally, but mostly the women were like the beleaguered wives or sisters or girlfriends or who are daughters or yeah. whoever. It was like about like the sort of alpha male, like Gordon had to like f- kind of knock down this sort of weird masculine alpha energy till it was like underneath him yeah or like, he had to like build it. them up yeah because like there was some i remember this one guy where they literally had him box in the middle of the episode i don't know if you remember that episode <laughs> it was ridiculous it was like so on the nose and it was like he That's was some karamo shit he was just this like sad sack guy <laughs> who just like looked really sad and he was like we're gonna go do some boxing and they like box and the man's like i i, I never knew my father like it's just oh, like it's so like on the nose and i was like laughing so hard because it was so ridiculous but it's not 100 percent humorous because like that person needed that no, totally yeah. totally like right like obviously like it's not funny but it's sort of funny because it's like it's both it's both it's funny because it's needed yeah but also yeah or like just watching and it's like really it's about him or like or like the men who like think that they're they're and they're like they're like i'm in charge it's my restaurant they know like literally nothing and gordon is like well that's fine but like you know literally nothing and i know everything (laughs) so how are we going to negotiate that so i just feel like the whole show is just about this like gendered back and forth 
And I think this is true also. Like, I also watched Bar Rescue. <laughs> and Bar Rescue is sort of the same way. <laughs> it's really good, though. Belagered, w- w- like, it. woman bartender who's been, like, holding shit down for three yeah, years. Yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's, so it's just, like, it's, anyway, so, like, this is what I mean. It's, like, when you watch, when I watch enough of these things, like, Val came home and I was just, like, I have a theory. <laughs> Gordon Ramsay. <laughs> and, like, I feel like that, to me, is, like, when I'm consuming art and when I'm, like, doing stuff, even if it's not something particularly, like, quote, if it's, I, mean, I don't, I don't like phrases, like, high and low art, but, like, something that's not yeah. particularly, like, artistic or literary quote-unquote yeah um i think there's still a lot to be derived in fr- from it in terms of like pleasure like and what makes it interesting what what advances it forward what makes it pleasurable to watch um or not pleasurable i guess um yeah i have that feeling very often like my partner likes to uh point out that i really enjoy media with no conflict in it like i really true. enjoy shows with no conflict do you watch all the british do you watch like i super do you, mm-hmm. uh, escape to the country i watch escape to the country it's my favorite <laughs> program i Val really I also watch escape to the country <laughs> i like uh extreme homes australia edition because mm, it's even more extreme than other ones because in australia land is just forever right um, right because that is how the like land acquisition happened to that continent um and, and it's just yeah like and and in video games i love pokemon go because i can just like walk around and not play any gyms and just like collect my pokes and like <laughs> grow them and uh that there's something i discovered a few years ago called a nuzlocke run which is i believe named after the gamer who invented it but it's like a, a way to play uh the pokemon game boy games uh with like a series of really interesting rules so like in in gaming and like speed runs and streaming people put these really fascinating um constrictions on ways to play the game so like can you play super mario without ever using the a button you know or like different ways it is yeah. such a world yeah like look up summer games done quick um which editor eric of, of spirits um showed me several years ago and it's mm. like a charity um fundraising thing that happens every year and gamers like the best in class people who like set world records in like these different genres of playing these games do it live and it is so wholesome and they raise money for like amazing charities and it's just like it's it's the best of that world Oh my god! Um, but the Nuzlocke run involves several different rules. One of which is you can't use any like potions or items to like heal your Pokemon. And if your Pokemon dies, you have to release it. Like if it if it faints, you have to release it. And uh... as soon as I I heard that, I was like oh god i have been treating these animals as a like endlessly renewable resource and in mm-hmm. fact they're not like there's so much about that system that like it just didn't occur to me to question because it's in a video game but i feel like my instinct to kind of question these structures in the world is heightened and sharpened by my ability to like look at video games stories tv shows movies and right. be like is it feminist or not like was that a choice you know as a creator i i want to kind of always i wish i could turn off that brain sometimes which is why i really love escape to the country uh, but <laughs> in playing pokemon i I'm like, I like this makes it different. And I make such different choices if I know that I cannot ever let my team faint. Wait, can I yeah. can I um, tell you how I overthink Pokemon Go? Which yeah, I also please. Love. please. <laughs> which is instead of I'm cause we, like like to transfer them away. I actually hate that because I'm like, where are they going? I know. <laughs> like, where are they in, going? Are they playing in the PC? Like, do they have like food? See, to me, it feels like euphemistic. Like, it's yeah, like yeah. they're going to the upstate. You know, no. and I'm like, no. <laughs> And going to the ocean. <laughs> but, like, you know, unless you want to keep paying to up your, yeah. like, Pokedex or whatever. Like, yeah. you have to, you know. I always am, like, very kind of weirded out by that. Like, where are they going? Yeah. What's happening to them? I'm actually, because they have this now this, like, Team Rocket. And then they have these, right. like, Possessed. Or what are they? The Dark Pokemon with yeah. they're Possessed, oh, no. basically. And I'm, like, very upset about it. Someone. And I'm, like, those that's not poor, their fault. That's not their fault. I, that's exactly what I think every time. I'm, like, <laughs> it's not their fault. Like, they're just, you know, they're just Pokemon. They're just little monsters. They're just living their lives. I don't I know. To rescue it's, them. They're victims. I really I, I think maybe like that's that's what makes like a writer, an artist, a creative type is like vastly overthinking um everything, <laughs> like narratively. Um, which is something that my family always used to tease me about, like overthinking stuff. But I think that's just like the way that my brain works. And no, it, I'm just thinking, man. It is hard. And also like, yeah, sometimes I wish I could turn it off. Though I agree that these like conflict-free like escape to the country is really pleasurable because it's just like nobody's like at the end they're like, Have you chosen a house? They're like, not yet. And they're like, Great. I know. <laughs> at the end of the episode. <laughs> and there's none of that like artificial like he likes tiles she likes carpet like, th- no. like well, how will it you know it's none of that like bullshit it's just like you know 
sort of lovely, like people having like a lovely little trips and like, you know, yeah. looking at some cool houses. and or, or even Chopped, where like we know exactly what's going to happen. Every segment is going to be the same length. Like Ted is going to be there in another fabulous tie. And at <laughs> the end of it, like no one's career has been validated or not. Like right. no one's self-worth has been judged. It's just like, did I do okay with these ingredients in this competition today? Right. And it's just like, it's right. so cut and dry yeah. in a way that it does register to me as like a plot-free TV because right. it's, it's just like a discrete example of like confidence or not and yeah I don't yeah know. Ugh, i love tv i love tv too <laughs> i know i wish i could like go home and read novels all day long but sometimes you need to like i know watch i mean i i do TV. and i think that like i have to be careful because sometimes i think because watching tv is easier because i do feel like when i watch tv i i i think i think le- like, i feel like when i'm reading a novel there's some like language part of my brain that's being activated that like makes me sort of a little more frenetic like there's some a more sense of a of activation and i think what yeah when i'm really tired it's like i can't read i just need to watch tv and i have to be careful i mean i'm just tired a lot which is like part of the problem <laughs> yeah. um but yeah no <laughs> i don't know i just i feel like the thing we come back to again and again on the show is like being um aware of and critical of the stories around you and like not just kind of accepting narratives that are given to you or the the role that like life or people around you tell you that you have but mm-hmm. knowing that like every every narrative is constructed and you always have the option to to change it to opt out of it to rewrite it yeah yeah i love that well, Carmen, thank you for coming in and talking with us about all my favorite subjects. Oh, my God, of course. My Seriously. pleasure. Anytime. <laughs> and please let folks know where they can find you and your work in bookstores and online. Um, so my website is CarmenMariaMachado.com. My Twitter and my Instagram are at Carmen M. Machado. My book in the dream, my memoir in the dream house is out now. There you go. <laughs> um, and I am doing events in Brooklyn. I haven't, uh, I'm doing it, but I don't actually know. I don't remember when. Um, so folks can check out your website for your tour schedule yes. and for links to get the book. Absolutely. Beautiful. Well, thank you again. Of and course. listeners, remember, stay creepy, stay cool. Thanks again to our sponsors at calm.com slash spirits. You can get 25% off a calm premium subscription at skillshare.com slash spirits two spirits. And then the number two, you can get two free months of Skillshare premium and at Warby Parker, get a free home try on kit at warbyparker.com slash spirits. Spirits was created by Amanda McLaughlin, Julia Shafini, and Eric Schneider, with music by Kevin McLeod and visual design by Allison Wakeman. Keep up with all things creepy and cool by following us at Spirits Podcast on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and Tumblr. We also have all of our episode transcripts, guest appearances, and merch on our website, as well as a form to send us your urban legends at spiritspodcast.com. Join our member community on Patreon, patreon.com slash spiritspodcast for all kinds of behind the scenes stuff. Just $1 gets you access to audio extras with so much more available too. Recipe cards, director's commentaries, exclusive merch, and real physical gifts. We are a founding member of Multitude, a collective of independent audio professionals. If you like spirits, you will love the other shows that live on our website at multitude.productions. And above all else, if you liked what you heard today, please share us with your friends. That is the very best way to help us keep on growing. Thank you so much for listening. Till next time. <laughs>